Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Plant Medicine, Cannabis, Psychedelics, and Pharmaceuticals. I know I tell you guys every day, oh, I'm excited, I'm excited, but today for real, I got my sisters in the house. Wow. We are family. I Indeed. got all my sisters with me. <laughs> I got my sisters in the house. Aww. Before I get to my sisters and introduce them, guys, you know what's up? <laughs> it's house cleaning time, spring cleaning. Let's do our house cleaning. What is our house cleaning? This show is for educational purpose and should not be taken as medical advice. Consult with your doctor for all your medical need. Do not stop or start any medicine, including your herbal medicine, without talking to your doctor. Having said that, uh, for those of you that are just joining us and you're wondering, who the heck is she? <laughs> I am Dr. Lola, also known as Dr. O, the founder of WCI Health, uh, your alternative health and wellness hub. We help you level up on your wellness journey using the healing powers of botanical, like cannabis, psychedelics, using education as tools. Other than that, WCI Health, they are the makers of glows, CBD infused uh, products, for everything concerning them, go to their website, wci-health.com. Other than that, what else do we need to talk about? Yes, yeah, sponsor. <laughs> Without sponsor, we won't be here. So this show is sponsored by WCI Health, your alternative health and wellness hub. They are also the makers of Glows. Glows has, they have pet shampoos, they have everything you need that is CBD, hemp derived, product. Go out and check them out, wci-health.com. And also, I want to say thank you to you, those of you that are su uh, supporting us on Patreon, on Apple Podcasts, and you are supporting our Health Ecos Wealth uh, membership series, you are indirectly supporting this show. So we really do appreciate you guys so much. And other than that, I got my sisters in the house today, I have the co-founders of Plant Media Project. Plant Media Project, they are events, they are focused on plant medicine like cannabis and psychedelics. Basically, they are bringing education to us. I mean, for years, generation, these plants have been demonized. So these are amazing ladies that are doing amazing things in our community. And part of those amazing thing they are doing is bringing awareness about the father plant like cannabis, like psychedelics and their medicine. Thank you. Uh, join me in welcoming Gina Vincel. Welcome to the show. Thank you and so I much. And I have Dr. Elizabeth Sheldon here. Hello. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you Pleasure. for having us. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I can't do justice to you guys. You guys are just too much. I can't do justice. Gina is an event coordinator. She is the founder of Easy Street Promotion. She is a TEDx uh, member. I need to come on that TEDx. <laughs> <laughs> she is a TEDx board member. So they create uh, events in Pittsburgh area. And of course, uh, Elizabeth, when you, I mean, we are already talking about uh, default, uh, let, uh, let us go up the cliff. When we're talking about going up the cliff in uh, DC, uh, Elizabeth is our DC foe. She is an insider, Washington insider for us. She is a former uh, Capitol Hill uh, correspondent, and she's also the co founder of uh, Plant Media Project. These ladies are also the host of the podcast, Divine Plant Media uh, Project podcast. So they also have a podcast and I've been on their show as well. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so much that you guys do. I'm going to start with you, Elizabeth. I need you to tell me everything that I cannot, I'm not going to murder it. So talk to me. <laughs> How did you find yourself? What have you done in the past? How did you find yourself in the plant medicine space? 
Well, I have always been um, a plant medicine user, if you will, um, from a young time uh, and used it for, uh, I mean, I guess we all use it to feel better, right? Definitely. And, and maybe I would say recreationally um, as a youngster. And then um, as time has passed and Marilyn uh, passed the medical program here, we, I, I was like, I've got to be part of this. And so Gina and I both started a cannabis lifestyle magazine. Um, and that unfortunately uh, went away uh, during COVID and, and some other things. And so the two of us came together to um, make Plant Media Project a reality. And uh, so I, I do come from inside the Beltway issue advocacy, um, sort of that corporate world. And it's really been an eye opener to immerse myself in this world. Um, you know, it's just a lot of people who are very passionate, who are about the healing qualities of these plant medicines, psychedelics, cannabis, um, you name it. Uh, I was with some women yesterday and one woman leaned over and she's like, I just, you know, went to a ketamine clinic out West and I feel like a completely new person. I know that, you know, I need another uh, treatment, but, you know, people are coming out of the woodwork when you tell them what you do, <laughs> you know, everybody has some relation, right? Whether yeah. it's in your family or someone, you know, or a friend. Um, so, uh, I come by it honestly, but I am a lot more thoughtful. And um, I understand now that if we're going to use these uh, medicines therapeutically, that it does need to be under guidance and there not, does need to be integration. And, yeah. um, you know, I think with maturity. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you learn those yeah. things. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I always, you guys have been in my uh, rooms many, many times in our clubhouse room that I say, these are medicine. I, I, I mean, I grew up with herbal medicine. And to tell you the truth, I tell people some, I say, I even trust my herbal medicine a lot more sometimes. Why? Maybe because I was introduced to it at a very early age. Mm. That brings me to you, Gina. Talk to me, mama. Talk to me. Tell me about your background, how you find yourself in the plant medicine space, and how you two came together, these two powerhouses. I mean, putting a face to, to this plant medicine. Talk to me, Gina. <laughs> well, first, Dr. O, thank you so much for having me. I was so excited to get your email that we could speak to together. So thank you. You know, I, I, like you said, I started really as an events professional in my hometown, working with a lot of nonprofits, helping people, you know, bring their events to life and working with community. And during that time, I saw that a lot of people were suffering um, and looking for alternative ways to heal just from working with the community on the ground. And during that time, uh, Pennsylvania was fighting to get a medical cannabis program. And so I really dove into supporting that, those initiatives. And then once Pennsylvania passed, I became a medical patient myself. And I've really been working hard to support patients with education the best that I can, give them resources, connect um, just the community together so that people have a place to go to, to connect to discuss these things in a safe environment. And through that, we have done several events in my local community, and we've done some digital events as well. Um, but I realized that as the pandemic happened and all events were canceled and my completely mm -hmm. world with my Easy Street business was flipped upside down, I'd recently just launched this uh, medical cannabis lifestyle publication, and that's how I had met Elizabeth. So we were in separate states, you know, with her in Maryland and me in Pennsylvania, both working really hard, connecting with the cannabis communities in our states to build these publications. And I got my publication to launch in November of 2019. We had a massive party. It was fantastic. You know, I had to get it approved by the Department of Health because I had all these, you know, cannabis companies all together, and it was a fantastic event. And like Elizabeth said, our April 2020 issue uh, never came out because of the pandemic. And during that time, Elizabeth and I looked at each other and said, you know, we had put two years, two and a half years mm -hmm. of our life 
into building these publications because we were going to use the magazines as a tool to mm -hmm. educate the community. It was a free magazine, you know, going to be distributed all over in the community, not just in dispensaries, but, you know, in grocery stores and in various <laughs> other places. So this was going to be such a great way. So when this ended and we realized it wasn't going to happen anymore, I wasn't ready to give up. I mean, I felt like we were just at the beginning of all this and we needed to get started. And Elizabeth had the same passion and I as I did. And I was like, you know what, maybe we should just start something together. And because of the mm -hmm. pandemic, knowing that, you know, to start a new magazine at that time would have been very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. So we decided, you know what, digital um, would be a great way for us to spread the message. So we immediately started the Vine podcast and, you know, have been doing that we're on I think 48 episodes now within the yeah, year so congratulations been, thank you yeah and we've been we decided during that time during the pandemic as well just after after talking with so many different patients and veterans and folks that cannabis was one plant medicine that could be used as a tool but there are so many others as well that could be utilized and so we took a step back saying yes we cannabis is still important to us you know we we're still fighting for federal legalization and, and ending the stigma around that but we also started thinking about how you know psilocybin and other plant medicines and fungi could be utilized um, as alternative healing methods for folks suffering from ailments that you know other traditional pharmaceuticals aren't supporting like severe PTSD mm -hmm. and anxiety and depression. And so we decided, you know what, with Plant Media Project, we want to focus on not just ending the stigma around cannabis, but raising awareness and discussions around psychedelics and plant medicines and how these can be healing tools um, to help others. So really, you know, I have my events business still, so I'm yeah. still kicking. I got things going there, <laughs> um, you know, in Pittsburgh, and I love to travel and do events. But, you know, my heart and soul is into Plant Media Project and growing our new business. And our hopes is is that you know we're really going to be able to support businesses not only through um, the marketing that we do because we can you know do all sorts of uh, compliant ways that cannabis and psychedelic businesses can advertise because we know it's tricky to advertise yeah. on social media. It's yeah. there's all sorts of rules and regulations with traditional uh, media and marketing. Mm -hmm. So we have that aspect of our business, but we have the the podcast and the blog and and the online educational events because we don't just want to be a B two B business. We yeah. really want to make sure that the consumers and, and the community yeah. um, has access to this information. Information as well. That is amazing. I mean, that is, uh, I, I tell people, it's not just cannabis. Our forefathers have been using herbal medicine for generations. Uh, I grew up back of my house. We had mango tree. I'm sure you guys have heard that story. I tell that story a lot because that is my childhood. It's, it's what I was used to. I was talking to my sister the other day. It's like, you know, we used to, we had even stuff for diarrhea, for constipation, that harbor. So that brings me, it, it is a medicine. And uh, and the, this is a time for even folks to begin to understand it's not just the herbal medicine that we can even use as a wellness tools. We have exercise, we have breath work, we have all kind of stuff. So we shouldn't just put ourselves in a box and say, okay, oh, it's cannabis. Hey, ooh, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> that brings me to you, Elizabeth. With you guys in the media advertising, uh, just like uh, Gina said, how difficult it is to uh, when you talk about marketing plant medicine. I mean, social, they, they keep shutting people down every day. What are the challenges that you guys are facing uh, in this space? So you're exactly right. Um, and, and Gina is certainly, um, you know, she's a social media uh, educator. So she is like literally on the pulse of this. And, and I, I've learned a lot in working with her. And um, you're exactly right. You, you cannot advertise traditionally on any of the social media networks. Um, LinkedIn is, is pretty friendly, but mm -hmm. other than that, and Twitter, um, Twitter, and Twitter, oh, sorry. Twitter, and Twitter, and and Twitter. Yeah. she knows. And um, so what we're doing is a geofencing and geotargeting in a compliant way. So they're publishers that say we will accept this kind of advertising and there's an age gate and we can go in and um, 
ge we've geofenced every dispensary in the country. So we can go in and, and target a building. We can target a 10 mile radius. We can target different states um, and serve ads compliantly because it is tough for all of these brands to say, you know, I mean, that's, that's how we uh, choose our, our milk brand, our, our corn brand, our potato brand, what, you know, it, it's, it's about uh, having that out in the marketplace. And it's really hard for these businesses that are starting out to um, get their message out. Why are they the best? Why are they, you know, why do they have X, Y, and Z? Um, so we've had some really good success with that geo-targeting and geofencing. That's awesome. And um, I know folks, they'll be, I have some listeners, they say, oh, but Dr. O, you said we're going to take all the medical jargons, all this big tests out of here. What the heck is geofencing and geotargeting? Gina, talk to me. Okay. Tell my I will, I will give you. I'll give you an example instead of explaining it so that you can imagine. So let's say that you look up a certain pair of shoes that you want to buy and you really you, you go onto a website and, and you're interested in buying it. And then all of a sudden, that pair of shoes follows you around for the rest of the day, right? When you go onto another website, you see that pair of shoes, you're on social media. That you see that pair of shoes. <laughs> there you go. So it follows you everywhere. So what this literally is, is that that advertiser says, okay, you like our product or you looked into it, or maybe you fit that that um, demo that we're looking to reach. And so it's a way to literally get the ads directly to those customers. And because we're attached to our cell phones all the time, and it's right close to us, everyone, you know, this is a scary kind of thing. It's very it big is. brother, but we use them. And people know that, that um, they have location services attached to all of the apps and the things that they're using. So anytime that you're on any social media network, it's collecting information about you. It's collecting whether or not you like to eat here or, or visit certain sites or um, spend money in certain places. And so all of that data is being collected by these sites and these apps. And it's creating a profile, a digital profile of who you are, what kind of you know, person are you in terms of what you buy, what you like, where you go. And so it is a little, you know, as a mom of an eight-year-old, like I've tried to keep my little one, like I, I ever, you know, she's allowed <laughs> on YouTube kids, but like certain things, you know, I don't want her to necessarily get served this stuff too soon because it mm -hmm. is kind of scary. You, you are yeah. created this digital kind of profile of yourself. And it is important for us to take note when we download certain apps and things like that, just like a little side thing for a social media education. If you don't want to be tracked and you don't like that, you have the ability to turn off location services and to tell apps that you don't want to be tracked. So nothing that's being done with geofencing or geotargeting is illegal. You're actually mm -hmm. giving people the ability to track you by downloading these and using these apps. But what it helps the cannabis and, and community and the psychedelic space is that where other traditional where you can't particularly buy an ad on a certain website, you can buy it through geofencing and geotargeting. So if somebody, if you're looking to reach, I'll give you an example. We have a, a client that's a dispensary that wants to advertise their delivery services. Well, their delivery service only goes to a certain location around the dispensary. So what we've done is created a campaign where we have found customers and clients that are within just that specific area and they're served ads. Then we place a little link on their website where the checkout is for the dispensary um, uh, payments and are able to see how many people saw that ad and went to their website to purchase. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> crazy that this is the way that the world is, but it gives us at this time when other advertising is so difficult for cannabis and psychedelic brands, an avenue to actually reach the specific customers and clients you would want. No kids, adults, in a certain demo, in a certain location, without having waste of spend of extra dollars and casting a wide net to just everyone, finding those specific people that you want to reach and targeting them. That is so cool. And to tell you the truth, it might sound like a really freaky wacko thing when we begin to think about it. But at the end of the day, it's really, really a gift, especially like you said, to our community, to the plant medicine community. That is pretty cool. 
that is pretty and we're not gonna give our uh competitor all our secrets today anyway. <laughs> that's awesome yeah we were when uh, earlier we were talking about uh psychedelics i want to come back to you uh elizabeth what do you think about uh micro dosing and macro dosing i mean they when you go to clubhouse it's a whole lot of it's like a kind of warm when you mention this topic. What are uh, your opinion? I'm going to let you talk first, Elizabeth, and I'm going to go to Gina. Talk to me. What do you guys think? Do you even think there's a benefit in it at all? I, I have to say um, personally that uh, microdosing has really helped me. It's taken a lot of trial and error, and it's only been, frankly, in the past week that I have figured out um, this microdose that I can take that I don't feel and my spirits are lifted. <laughs> I don't feel the depression. So uh, we also work with the, the Plant Medicine Coalition in DC um, and they had uh, were the ones responsible for getting Initiative 81 passed for uh, decriminalizing psilocybin in DC so that you, you cannot uh, go to jail for it. Um, and the woman who is at the head of the organization had uh, postpartum depression and literally uh, cured herself through microdosing. So unfortunately, I don't know, other than coming to you or, or another doctor like you, um, you know, it is trial and error. And I do believe in the macro dosing when you have an experience that um, where you can see the trees uh, speak to you and breathe. And um, I think that's important too. So I am a fan of both. And again, the micro dosing, um, it's taken me a while, but I feel like I'm really figuring it out for myself. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, what about you, uh, uh, Gina? What about you? What do you think about? And also, I want to specifically ask you, there's this uh, saying out there that all this mysticism, taking mysticism out of psychedelics. And what do they say? They say, oh, science, uh, mysticism, the magic is more of a science uh, that is not detected yet, or unknown science. What, what are your take uh, when people begin to uh, look at these indigenous practices and feel like, oh, it is science? And I, I'm going to let you talk to me. What do you think about that? Well, I definitely think that, you know, there's, there's something magic in nature, right? I mean, there's something that maybe, you know, because sometimes things are unexplainable um, in science, that's what makes it so intriguing, right? Because you want to find an answer for every little thing. And one of the things about, you know, microdosing is that, you know, each batch of the psilocybin that you try could have various different, you know, uh, potencies. So if you take the same, you know, quantity in one dose um, to the next, you know, it could have different effects for you. Um, and so I, you know, when I talk with folks about microdosing or wanting to get into utilizing psilocybin, you know, really the idea of starting low and going slow. And I know you mentioned that a lot on your, on your uh, podcast and in our clubhouse chats, I really believe that that's the way to go. I get nervous when I hear people that, you know, have maybe had some, you know, mega, uh, as we call them hero dose journeys of, you know, eight grams or more of psilocybin, you know, being in rooms and clubhouse telling others that have no clue about it, any fungi at all, telling them that that's how you have to do it. And I don't think that there's just one way. I do believe that the, the, you know, based on the research that we've read and, and things that are coming out Johns Hopkins that, you know, macro doses may have, you know, a, 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 a jolt or rewire some neural pathways for some folks that maybe suffer from PTSD and, and, and severe depression. But again, under care, you know, these are, you know, instead of just, you know, telling someone to take these medications, if they suffer from, you know, any kind of, you know, mental illness that could, this could somehow, you know, drum up some more difficulties for them. And if they don't have someone there to sit with them and to help them with integration, it could actually maybe have 
adverse effects to what they were really looking for. So, I mean, I personally, you know, started um, microdosing during the pandemic um, as just a way to kind of like get through a lot of the pain that I was feeling with, you know, losing my job, my magazine, everything at the time. And, you know, it made me feel that I was able to become closer to nature, um, become a better mother, um, feeling more present with her, um, feeling forced um, to unplug um, from social media and from, from the digital world and feel more connected within my own mind and within my own body. Um, and that's for me personally. However, I can tell you that the journeys that I've had you know, that are with larger doses have had major impactful meanings with me. I mean, when I was in my twenties, I had done a macro dose when I was struggling with some eating issues. And, you know, I ripped that full length mirror off the wall and I said, I would never be a slave to my self image again. And, you know, really hadn't suffered from, you know, bouts of, uh, of um, anorexia or anything since. And there's some really great studies coming out right now out of Johns Hopkins that are researching the use of and benefits of psilocybin with eating disorders, which I think is really interesting. So I feel that this is such an individualized discussion that when you talk with someone that maybe has experience with it, they're going to tell you macro is the way to go. But I really feel that, you know, finding that, that special combination, just like when we talk about cannabis, you know, you can try a bunch of different strains, but you realize that it's really the terpenes that, that matter. I think that with psilocybin, it's really like how, what you're using it for and what you need for it and making sure that you have others and a community around you to support you so that you're not testing these things out on your own and having community with you. Now, the science side of this, this is where I'm really, I would love to get your thoughts on this, Dr. O, because, you know, I feel that, you know, we haven't, if, if we, I feel that if the pharma community would have figured out how to synthesize cannabis, then maybe it would already be <laughs> approved now. But mm -hmm. since psilocybin is now, you know, being patented in, in a kind of a, a pharmaceutical way, a synthesized way, feel like that there's almost an opportunity for psilocybin to become available to, to people quicker than maybe even cannabis uh, legally nationwide. We're seeing that so much research is being done and so much is happening nationwide to push politically this research to show that specifically fungi can be utilized for these things. But I don't know. I feel really torn about this nature versus science and not sure how I personally feel about it. Because if, if the synthesized version can help more people, that's great. But if we take the psychedelic out of psychedelics, do we lose that mysticism and important magical part of nature that makes these plant medicines so powerful? Thank you, Gina. Yeah, yeah that is, uh, I mean, uh, like I said, I uh, um, I talk about the science of, of this plant. First of all, I want to talk about the fact that even when you take it, just like you're taking a, a pinch of salt, that is the way I see it. Others might not see it the same way. Like when we put salt in our food, we'll put a little bit. Just that little bit of salt goes a long way. I remember when I was growing up, my dad, he, he had a high blood pressure and the doctor said, don't take salt. So in the beginning, it was compliance. He wasn't taking salt. Then he was like, man, this food tastes crappy. Man, put a little oh, bit of that salt in there. We are going to die anyway. <laughs> I guess I get my craziness from him. Uh, Elizabeth, what, what is your take uh, when we look at uh, synthetic uh, compared to the plant, the, like the whole broad spectrum plant. What is your take in that? Well, I, you know, Gina and I talk about this um, back and forth. And I, you know, coming from the corporate world, working with pharma, I, I know that, you know, there, there's some stigma around that, right? And some demonizing. But I feel that if you can extract some of these compounds from psilocybin, and you can help uh, people heal um, that maybe can't take the psychedelic effect, you know, from whatever malady they suffer. Um, I, I feel that pharma can help give more people access. I, I am certainly aware of the mysticism and, you know, the indigenous use of these things. But does one have to be without the other? Can't I, I 
hope in, in a perfect world, they can coexist, right? People who want to go the farmer route, who, you know, it's synthesized, they know the exact dosing, uh, all of those things, that that's available to them. And then, you know, others who want to have a more mystical experience or, you know, enjoy doing uh, the mushroom in its, you know, natural form can do that. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer, but I, I believe there's room for both. And I, I agree. do think there's a rub. I, yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I mean, I'm like a pendulum, really, when it comes to this, because I am out there in the realm of the big pharma and all the stuff. Right. And when you talk about uh, who have perfected the act of route of administration, dosing, uh, pharma have gone way ahead of everybody, and they have the technology already established that they can take this uh plant and actually made it accessible to to folks and i was talking to uh, one of my guests recently on iboga and and the mysticism and all this other stuff really how are we going to take everybody that needs this medicine and say okay hey guys let's go to peru Oh, hey, guys. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's go to the root of it. We're going to Buwiti, Buwiti land. We're going to Congo. It's not going to be uh, possible for us to take everybody to these places. Most people are, a lot of people are not even going to be able to afford the trip because these things are not cheap. It's kind of like a, a resort, kind of like a whole nine yard. But at the same time, I just, uh, I agree with, uh, with, with you, Elizabeth. We just have to be careful because right now, when I'm looking at the cannabis space, we already having uh, phosphorylated THC, methylated THC. Basically, they will take some of the side chain and put a stronger bond in there. And I'm, I'm a little bit scared about that. There are some people that are gonna need that, that need that extra 35, uh, potency. You get what I'm saying? Well, not everybody are going to need that. And I all just want to make sure that the big farmers, they should put their greed aside this time around and focus on, on, on the people. Why am I saying that? Because the opioid epidemic, that was how we started. We had endorphin in our body. We have regular good old morphine. And so oh, that's not enough for us. We need to have that logic. We need to have Embida. We need to have uh, Opana ER. Opana ER, we had to take it out of the market. That's how really addictive and really dangerous that medicine was. So it's, it's, it's a lot that we have to be responsible for. And that's part of why what you ladies are doing is really, really amazing. So, because, I mean, if we are not talking about, especially ladies, mothers, putting a face to this plan is huge. It's huge. This is really going along. And I really want to thank you ladies for what you're doing. Uh, I haven't said that as a mom, uh, I am a mom of three boys. They are teenagers. Gina, I know you are. Elizabeth, we are all moms, a kind of mom, plant medicine moms. My kids, they, they have been, I mean, and all our kids, they've been taught, they are still being taught in school, don't mess with drugs, don't, don't do drugs and all that stuff. Suddenly, parents are using these plants that have been presented to the children as drugs. How do you people navigate that space? How do we begin to talk to our parents? Keys about plant medicine. Like me, my husband has been using cannabis. I mean, before I even met him, and we've met, we, we've been married now for close to 19 years. We've known each other close to 20 years. So they, they, they do see it. But at the same time, how do you begin to talk to them? Because eventually the children are going to need uh, some of this medicine too. I'm going to go to uh, Elizabeth first. Um, 
I think it's a real conundrum and I, you know, hats off to you with teenagers and Gina has, you know, a young child. Um, I, when I got back into this, um, you know, my children were old enough to, to understand. I do think we need to come up with a way and a program and, um, you know, somebody's going to do it somewhere. Uh, how we talk to children about medicine. We've done that with alcohol. It's the same thing. Our brains, you know better than I do, Dr. O, are, are not fully formed until we're, what, 25? Um, I can't imagine how much smarter I'd be if I, <laughs> if I lived a little cleaner life as a young person. But, um, you know, if we can continue with that, there are children, I was at the Cannabis Science Conference and I met one of the uh, children from the movie, uh, We the People, where they followed five children with stage four cancer and they, they came up with a formula of cannabis. And this girl is now 16 years old. And it, it is just you know amazing. And she is able to take her medicine you know, in her school and she's excused to go do talks. And so how do we educate in a big way that if you need the medicine, you know, then it's administered and it's done through adults. Um, and if you don't need it uh, and you, you typically don't as a, as a healthy child, then you wait to make those decisions when you get older, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, yeah. I, I definitely want to hear from you all because I, I think it is a really, it's a tough area. Yeah, it is. And uh, like, uh, it is really, really a challenging uh, area because you, you've already, there's that rule that has already been established in the children's uh, life. Uh, then suddenly you say, whoa, 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 you know what? Those stuff we talked to you about before, it's not really the same thing. And there are still some dangerous uh, compounds out there. So we, you cannot say it's, it's tough for us to say, okay, you can take this. You cannot take the world if they present these, say like psilocybin, say psilocybin is good. How would they know the difference between psilocybin or some crazy stuff that somebody will concur up out there? Gina, do you think as uh, time goes on and legalization begin to set in, do you think schools will take it upon themselves maybe to start gradually talking to children and educating them about this plan? Because right now, we, I do, uh, we, uh, we do uh, see continuing education in pharmacy. Before, nobody was talking about cannabis at all in, in, in pharmacy at all. But I enroll, I enroll in some of DC, I just signed in and I was looking at your courses and there you are, you have CBD, you have cannabis as a continual education. So even in the profession, mm -hmm. people are beginning to talk about it, even though the whole pharmacy uh, community, they're acting like plant medicine doesn't even exist. It's very little of us that are in this space. So do you think as we begin to legalize this plant, that will help to push the education, especially to the children forward? I, I think that once legalization happens, we're gonna be forced to do that. I mean, we can't be going into uh, schools teaching a DARE program that's completely outdated, that uses language that's wrong, that uses scenarios that really don't exist anymore. So I think that the entire failed war on, war on drugs needs to be reconsidered. And we need, to we need to really think about how we talk about this in an honest way with kids from when they're young. You know, you know my daughter just turned eight years old. You know, I've been working in this industry almost four years years now. And I can tell you when she was really little, I mean, I was nervous and like, oh man, I'm about to launch this cannabis magazine. You know, I'm joining the PTA. What are these moms going to think know. about me? You know, and I know. And I just, you know, it's, it's actually been surprisingly, um, different than what I expected, you know, 
be, by being honest enough to put myself out there about um, wanting to make changes and being an activist and advocate around, around plant medicine, there are so many people that privately message me on social media mm -hmm. or get my email or call me, um, somehow get my phone number and leave messages being like, I know you don't know me, but you know, either I have a loved one that has cancer or I am suffering from depression or I have a friend or loved one that needs mm -hmm. help. And I don't want to ask the general public, you don't post this stuff on Facebook. They yeah. don't want people to know that they're even interested in it. So yeah. by just putting myself out there a little bit, I've seen actually surprisingly a pretty good response from other moms specifically um, in the community. And my little one, you know, I've just always talked with her about, you know, uh, plants can be medicine. And I talk about how plants is in terms of food can mm -hmm. be medicine. Um, so when, when I, when we talk about it, I don't, I don't, I don't, she knows the word cannabis. Um, you know, I never say marijuana or weed or use any yeah. of those kind of languages. I, you know, I only refer to it as cannabis or medical marijuana, which is what our state requires us to call it. So that one, if my daughter does go to school, she might think that all cannabis is CBD, but in second grade, maybe that's all that she needs to tell her friends. That's and good. she has, they don't have comes to out know of her everything. mouth, right, right. Yeah, this they is, don't I'll have explain. to know everything. We'll get yeah. into the full cannabinoid profiles later. Let's start, let's <laughs> okay. start with something. That's okay. Simple, okay. Right? Okay. Back. <laughs> and we'll start with that. But you know, when, you know, when we're, you know, having a Saturday afternoon and, you know, maybe mommy has a little microdose already in her and there's something about how, when you, I ingest a little bit of some mushrooms appear everywhere. So next thing I know we're walking around the backyard and we're collecting and foraging, you know, a dozen or so different types of mushrooms. And she sees the things come from the ground and she knows that some of them can be poisonous and some of them can be eaten and some of them can be used as medicine. So for an eight-year-old kid, that's maybe enough education. Now, once you start yeah. to become teenagers and it's like, okay, well, <laughs> cannabis is maybe more readily available. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation has to change about how, yes, you're going to be able when you're an adult to make these decisions, but you have to allow your brain and your body to really, you know, develop before you start, you know, using it in an adult use yeah. capacity, unless you are a child that needs it as medicine and kind yeah. of creating conversations with yeah. kids in that, that age is something that we need to talk about and figure out what we're going to do because it's we, the DARE program and things have failed us. It's not working. The kids, kids are turning to all sorts of different compounds, yeah. not knowing how to use them well beyond any plant medicines. We're talking about yeah. all different kinds of drugs. We're seeing how opioids are completely, we're seeing people die over them day in, day yeah. out. So how can we change this language? How can we work together to maybe create as a plant medicine community, some language that we feel can be appropriate for both little kids, but then also teenagers that are, you know, so more likely to get access to these medicines. And you guys are already doing it. You, you want to uh, come in, uh, Elizabeth? I, I just wanted to say that I think that the alcohol not driving and drinking even though you know during my kids growing up there were a few teenagers who died through that it was nothing like it used to be so there are mm -hmm. programs that work my children will not get in a car after they've had a drink that you know whatever they mm -hmm. did at school um that is it, it's much like in my day you know, teenage pregnancy. So yeah. there are programs that work and um, we need you young moms to, <laughs> to think about how are we gonna go in there and do that to, to, <laughs> to first decide what yeah. is the message and yeah. then how do we impart that in a way yeah. that resonates. Yeah, and, and that is where we're going to eventually going to schools and speaking to this kid is going to be a key, especially for those of us that are public speakers. Those are the areas we could really target uh, in the in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are ramp, uh, ran, uh, rounding down. Uh, I want to quickly, this discussion is not going to be complete without us bringing the Black, Indigenous people of color. Mm -hmm. I know the two of you are very great advocates for our community. And I, I, I mean, I see what you guys do on a daily basis. Talk to us how much 
what more can we do when we're talking about the fact that people are still wallowing in jail, in prison over cannabis and a whole lot of folks are making millions out of this plant. What I know there is the uh, prisoners project and all kind of project. What other things are going on out there? Mm -hmm. Talk to me, uh, Gina, I'm gonna start with you first this time. Well, yeah, last prisoner project is a really good one to know. So if any of your listeners are not familiar with that organization, you know, definitely look it up. But I think that it, it really comes to all of us that care about this plant to really get involved with our local politics to inform and let our, our representatives, our senators know that we care about this, that we are not going to stand for this industry to continue to move forward while there are people sitting in jail over the same plant. And then that's why as much as I get so passionate about this, because it is a political issue as well. The mm -hmm. cannabis industry cannot safely bank. They cannot mm -hmm. advertise. They cannot do any of those things. We are, we are in a, in a, in a global, you know, mental health crisis right now, we could be utilizing the, you know, plan in a big way, but we have to use our voices. And as a white woman, I, I want to be, I'll be as loud as I possibly can for people yeah. that may not have the opportunity to use doing their that, voice you know. the way that I can. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I get fired up, Dr. O. I know. I really do because I, I, I don't know, I don't know how, you know, you can be in this industry and not see this as such an important part. And, you know, with all of this kind of, you know, oh, well, you know, will there be craft cannabis when we become, you know, a legal you know, country, because we can't just have, and you think about it, a great way to compare it would be thinking about, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and kind of like just the ma major brands or thinking about it as a beer, right? You know, you have your Budweiser's and your Miller Lights, but what about all the craft breweries everywhere? That's mm -hmm. what we need to transform yeah. into cannabis so that people without millions of dollars will still have access to get involved in this industry. And it can't just be for rich people to get involved in this, especially the legacy growers that were doing this and, and actually it healing is. our communities for years yeah. and had been targeted, you know, by the police to go to jail. They're the ones, mm -hmm. in my opinion, that should have the opportunity to be first in line to get these, these licenses and these micro Thank you, Gina. Uh, and um, I'm going to go to Capitol Hill now. <laughs> I'm going to Capitol Hill. <laughs> I am a political junkie myself. I love, I love all that craziness. I took a break from it. They're getting on my nerves. That, oh, we are I'm with up. you on that. Yeah, we are just... falling off the cliff again. We are always, this yes, time of are. the year, we have to always fall off the cliff. It don't make no sense. Elizabeth, talk to us. What can, what can we do? What can the D.C., Washington, what can they do I, I to mean, help us more? How can we push them up a little bit close to that cliff so they can come to our side when it comes to I, I know. I, I don't. I want to say, you know, my father said to me back in his day here, it's your turn. It's your generation's turn now. And I'm like, okay, you know, my generation, we haven't done enough. And I, I'm so sorry. I don't want to turn it over. I want to be part of the solution. But I, I don't know. I just, it is unbelievable to me that, um, you know, the, uh, that piece, the social justice piece gets waylaid. It just gets moved off, you know, all of these different bills and the legislation that's being put forward. And I understand on one hand that you can't have everything you want. It's a, you know, politics is about compromise. So you have to present it in a way that, you know, the majority can swallow it. But, you know, in good conscience, I don't know how we we don't fix this. I, I wish I had the answer and I might I feel uh, impotent around this. Um, I think people like Gina and yourself, you know, I mean, Gina is on the ground. Mm -hmm. She is, mm -hmm. you know, amongst the people yeah. fighting the fight. She's on the steps yeah. of her, you she know, is. state capital. Um, and uh, that that's what it's going to take. I mean, we all just have to scream from the rooftops yeah. like, you know, uh, but you're right, always going to do the right it thing. It has to be a compromise, though, Elizabeth, yeah. like you said, you know, we've had, you know, uh, Democrats, you know, 
fighting for, you know, cannabis legalization. But I, in my opinion, I think the way that it's been brought up has been polarizing. You know, you have to mm -hmm. come at this in a place where we're going to get to people to realize that cannabis should be a bipartisan issue. Mm -hmm. it should, it, it should, it's not blue or red, it's green, right? Like we shouldn't yeah. be thinking about cancer, it this way. Cancer is not saying, oh, you are red or you are blue, you are Republican, you are, you are, uh, epilepsy seizure is right. not saying you are this, you are that. And when it comes to the uh, justice uh, part of it, the minority, I just feel like, just like we did with the George Floyd uh, situation, the Caucasian, the uh, community stood up and say, we're not gonna stand for it. That, that combination of us, because what they use against us most of the time is, us against them but for for the white community to say we are not going because to tell you the truth the, we are talking about your neighbors we are talking about your best friend we are talking about your best friend's child i tell people i said my friends that are white that i know my colleagues they are embarrassed about this mess and sometimes to tell you that I feel sorry for them more sometimes because it's embarrassing. How do you tell your, your best friend that, oh, I'm sorry, I hate because of the color of your skin. It is embarrassing to everybody. An injustice to one is an injustice to all. And I just want to encourage uh, our Caucasian folks, white folks to keep continue fighting that fight because it's, it's, it's a fight for all of us. And look at United States, especially here in Florida. You can hardly walk the street and not see up to 10 folks. If you gather 20 people, at least half of them will be biracial. You, you're prosecuting your own member of your family. You know, there's no, there's no color in United States anymore. No. And we need to start beginning to reflect that. And I, I'm grateful for the great work the two of you are doing. Gina, you are a monster out there when it comes <laughs> to this activism. You, Julie, uh, Julie Bartel, I love you, uh, Elizabeth. You guys are, and Christy, Christy, uh, Christy, my Christy. You guys are monstrous when it comes to this this stuff, and it, it really because we need you people. If it's just us, it's just gonna be pushed aside. But when when we come together as one to say we're not gonna stand for it, there is power in number, and that's why I'm gonna say that. Before I let you guys know, what is your advice to our listener? First of all, I'm going to uh, go to Elizabeth, the listener that are new to this plant medicine space. Uh, what is your advice for them as per consumption, about the way we should see this? Because we don't want to turn it into another reform madness and all that. I'm going to let you talk on that. Then I'm going to let uh, Gina, call me as for folks that might be looking into this business, they want to go into this from your professional experience, what would be your tip for them uh, as far how to succeed in this space? Uh, Elizabeth, go I for think it, it's Elizabeth. very simple, Dr. O. I think if you're, a, 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 you know, this is something new to you, go to a doctor like yourself, go to a professional, and um, have a conversation about it. Find out the best way to consume, to go slow and low, you know, to start low, <laughs> go slow. Um, I, I just, I, when my friends come to me, I have two doctors here in Maryland that I am very comfortable with. And I, I say, please, this is who you need to go talk to. Now, you know, as well as I do, that there are a lot of doctors that are writing the cannabis scripts in these medical states that really don't have any experience or don't know. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to do your due diligence and, and come to people. I, I always, Gina and I always say, please just reach out to us directly. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get you hooked up. We'll talk to somebody who knows somebody. It's a yeah. small community. Um, and, and I think breaking into this business is really a difficult one. I'm going to let Gina handle that, but I, um, it, it is really, it is really difficult. And, um, I encourage people to do it because we all have to do difficult things, but, um, 
it but don't go in don't go in there naive thinking naive. oh everybody is jumping in there i'm finna jump in it's, it's, yeah it's, it's go do business. your research and all that stuff that's yeah. awesome gina uh talk to me uh what do you think uh for folks that basically elizabeth help you out here and i'm gonna I'm going to give you the last question. Elizabeth <laughs> already, already helped you out. It's not a bed of roses. Rosie it takes a long, long way. And we don't want to just start and just say, oh, because everybody started, you have to do your due diligence. So uh, ladies, uh, Gina, talk to us. Where can our folks uh, find you? First of all, I want to ask, do you guys cater when it comes to marketing events? Do you cater outside of your uh, jurisdiction? Yeah, we'll go anywhere and help anybody. Yeah, Absolutely. Folks, yeah, yeah. So folks, you hear these are uh, uh, vetted folks. They are part of our community. You have an event, you have uh, anything that you want to do. Uh, we're going to be putting their uh, contact on the show notes. Gina, talk to us. Uh, where can we find you? You can find us at plantmediaproject.com and our email addresses are just Gina at and Elizabeth at plantmediaproject.com. And you can find us on social media and connect with us through any of those accounts. And definitely just want to make sure that if you're interested in these things and, you, and you're scared to talk to your doctor, you know, find other members of the community to reach out to. Find yourself a community. You know, the Psychedelic Club has chapters all across the country. Um, you know, I know that there's groups like Empathic Health where you can join and, and it's a kind of a private group and community where you can talk with others um, in just other folks. So they're not, it's not medical advice, but if you're looking for a community, um, that's also another way to get a lot of advice. And if you're looking to get into business in this industry, let's really learn from a lot of the mistakes that happen within Absolutely. the cannabis space and realize <laughs> that psychedelics and plant medicine, you know, we should, you know, lead with heart and compassion and realize that this is something that can really heal and help us all. That is amazing, amazing, amazing. That's our show for today. I'm so, this one show is not going to cut it. I got to bring <laughs> you ladies back. Huh? We're going to be bringing you back. And folks, they have a podcast as well, Divine Plant Media Project Podcast. Go check it out. We are going to be putting the notes, all their contact information on our show notes. Ladies, I'm so honored to have you guys. Thank I appreciate you. you guys so Thank much. You. Thank you for Thank coming. You. I appreciate you. Okay, folks, that's our show for today. Uh, and if you remember, folks, if you are yet to pick my book, A Pharmacy's Guide to Cannabis Perspective of a Non-Conforming Clinician, go ahead and grab your copy. Uh, really, is uh, education is going to be the key. And if you are yet to join our tribes, you need to hump in your an organization. Yeah, we need you to come sponsor this show. We need the money to keep the show going. <laughs> so come join us. And remember, we are on Club Us Kennedy Psychedelic Club. And we also started on No uh, Club House Room. Basically, why we're doing this is that the African community, that's where the road is leading when it comes to plant medicine. And there is education is not even started in that space yet. So we started African Canadelic Club. Go check it out and come support. It's not just for the African or BIPOC community. It's also for folks like Gina, like Elizabeth, that are supporting their community that intend to eventually take their uh, business even to the African continent and be a blessing in that continent. Mm -hmm. That's what the uh, the show is for. So come support us there. And until next time, folks, remember health equals well. Bye, guys. Bye. See you. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am.